Good morning again, friends. Uh, we're about to start the second panel for today, the fourth panel of the conference. Uh, this panel is titled Transnational Confrontations, and we have two presenters with us. Uh, one is Curlan Bob of UWI Cave Hill, and the second is Adam Elliott Cooper of the United Kingdom. I'm going to introduce them briefly. Let me just introduce myself. My name is Suzanne Francis Brown. I am the curator of the UWI Museum, and we're very happy in our collaboration with the Department of History uh, on, this on this confrontations series of events, both an exhibition that's ongoing and the conference. Uh, just to briefly introduce our two presenters, Carlon Bob is a PhD student at uh, Cave Hill, and if you will forgive me jumping to my phone, her thesis is entitled Black Radicalism in 20th Century St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, of course, it's interesting to note, though I don't know if it's directly relevant, that the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines was the president of the Guild of Students here at the University of the West Indies in 1968 during the time of the uh, Rodney disturbances. Um, so, Carland will be speaking on the Black Power Movement in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 1968 to 1982. And then we'll have Adam Elliott Cooper, and Adam is a research associate at King's College London in the Geography Department. Uh, he is also representing the Monitoring Group uh, which is a grassroots anti-racist organization in the UK which challenges, challenges police and racial violence. Uh, he received his doctorate from the School of Geography and the Environment of the University of Oxford, and his current research focuses on urban displacement in London. He's also representing the monitoring group, and he will be speaking on the theme, We Didn't Come to Britain, Britain Came to Us, Caribbean Radicalism from Periphery to Core. They'll be speaking in that order, first Curlon Bob and then Adam Elliott Cooper. I hope you'll welcome them, thanks. Good day, everyone. I'm Curlon Bob from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, student at the Cavehill campus, and I've been doing a research on Black radicalism in 20th century St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The, one of the inspirations I got was, well, to embark on such a research was the fact that I got introduced to this book called Black Power in the Caribbean. And inside that book, I went into the table of contents and I was looking, looking for my island. But I kept looking and there, St. Vincent was nowhere present. So upon finishing my first degree at St. Caveville, I decided that I would look into uh, history, specifically our black power history, as it relates to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Because as a child, I grew up hearing here and there black power talks. I, I would have heard persons in my community talking about the movement, about black power this, black power that. Hence, I embarked on this study. Now, Black Power in St. Vincent, and right, there's a slight change to the year. I'm looking at 68 to 75 for the purpose of this, um, this conference. I firstly borrowed two definitions in defining what Black Power is. And according to Ronnie in his book, Growing Into With My Brothers, he defines it as a doctrine about black people, for black people, preached by black people. And also Carmichael and Hamilton went on to speak about it, defining it by saying that it's a call for black people in this country to unite, to recognize their heritage, to build a sense of community. It is also a call for black people to begin to define their own goals, to lead their own organization. It's also a call to reject the racist institutions and values of this society. 
So more or less, it was um, black power. And for me, I understand it to mean that I'm searching for an identity as a black person. Also, it's about me embracing my blackness and viewing black as a blessing and not as a curse. Now I'm going to place this movement within the Vincentian context. Now around 1968, there about there before, um, there, was a pre there was a white power presence. Like the rest of the Caribbean, we had black, um, white, the whites owning the economic power, the, um, the high commanding spaces were ruled and operated by the white class. Um, by that time also, we were still a colony of Britain. 1968, the year after, which would have been 1969, October 2017, Vincent would have, would have attained associated statehood ship status. So the, the entire period of 1968 to 1975, St. Vincent would, would have still been a colony of Britain. Um, also, within the Vincentian society, I borrowed a term, a concept from Carmichael and Hamilton, political modernization, which means that it is the act of, it is the act of questioning all values and institutions of society and searching for a new and different forms of political structures to solve the political economic problems. Now, upon my research interviews specifically, um, persons who were involved in the movement would have mentioned that in their minds, they would have been questioning a lot of things. They would have been questioning, why is it whenever they enter a bank, it is laced, the clerks are laced with, with, with light-skinned people? And why is it whenever they find themselves on perhaps a farm or in the construction area, it is the population of black outranks that, and sometimes there is no presence of, um, of a light-skinned person. So all of this at this time was, was um, a lot of people started to, their consciousness started to be reawakened. Um, also, we have a history of black consciousness. And when I say that, I mean that between 1912 and, and 1967, the spiritual Baptists, we call them the Shakers in St. Vincent, they were placed under a ban. They were not free to worship. Now, the spiritual Baptist, as many would know, is an Afro-Caribbean type of religion. And in this, in this um, religion, there is a tendency of embracing blackness. There is a tendency of preaching um, black history, people being finding this connection with Africa. So for over 50 years, this, this, um, this religion was banned on the island. So when I say his black consciousness is that we would have a portion of Vincentians who would have known and who would have had the idea of being pressured by the system because of practicing black, um, black religion, a black religion. In addition to that, in 1919, we would have a, um, a short stint of the Garvey movement. Um, while it operated as a trade union then, um, I, I would not, um, I would not um, skip the idea that persons were exposed, persons, Vincentians were exposed to what Marcus Garvey had to say in relation to um, black empowerment and black freedom, et cetera, et cetera. So Vincentians then, in the 19, between the 1919 and 1920, would have been, their, their consciousness would have been awakened by what Marcus Garvey had to say via the Negro wall. Um, also, again, in 1935, the masses, the, 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 the I would say the, black, the poor population, which was majority black, would have rise up against the um, administration, the white administration that was in St. Vincent. In addition to that, when we had that uprising in 1935, it was the same year Italy would have in, invaded Ethiopia. So they, they, our, our uprising would have occurred about a week or two after Italy would have invaded. So, so there was an exposure, because we were getting information, according to the records, we would have been getting information via newspapers, via um, 
people talking, etc., etc. Um, when it comes to the influences of our Black Power movement, there are three regional events that would have impacted our, 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 our the cause for the rise of our movement, the Rodney Riots in Jamaica in 1968, which we, everybody ha we have been bombarded with this for the entire. We am um, there, so I would not go into that. Of course, we know that we had Vincent Chan Presence, which was the Guild of President then, um, uh, Mr. Gonza Dr. Gonzalez. The Sir George Williams University Affair also had some influence on us in terms of we had students, student, we had a student present in this affair, um, one Rodney John. He was one of the complainants. He was one of them who signed. Um, also, a non-student at the time, but was a past student, is Alfie Roberts. He also became involved intimately in this, um, in this affair. And in 1970, the, there was a the Black Power Revolution in Trinidad where we also had um, Vincent John Presence, that being Jim Maloney and Roberts, there's Patches Knights. Now, all of this happenings, word would have been get coming back to St. Vincent, whether by newspapers, whether by um, students returning, and in specifically with the Sir George Williams University Affair, one Terence Ballantyne, he, would, he came to St. Vincent and he came to explain. So a lot of Vincentians were, um, were exposed to what really happened in, in, in um, Canada rather than believing what, was, what the newspaper was reporting, was reporting about the Canadian affair. In addition to that, locally, we had, I was told that a lot of Vincentians were exposed to radical literature. When I say radical literature, um, the grandma, newspapers, also um, persons began to interrogate the works of Walter Rodney, C.L.A. James, etc., um, Cabral, etc. Now we had St. Vincent and the Grenadines would boast of seven black power groupings um, ranging from developing from 1968 and I think the last one was in 1974. The educational forum of the people, well before I go on to that, we had two strands of this movement. We had an intellectual strand and we also had a grassroots strand. The intellectual strand was most of the EFPM, which is the Educational Forum of the People. And this group, in December of 1968, came up with the idea that they need to educate Vincentians about what was happening about, uh, in, in the world, worldview also, educate, educate Vincentians about their, their black consciousness and highlight the injustices that Vincentians were faced. This group also was mostly made up of international and regional university graduates such as Kenneth John, Parnell Campbell, Corinne Morris, just to name a few. Um, the EFPM also had two organs. One was called the Forum and one was also called the Fl Flambeau. Later it transformed into a political party which is known as the Democratic Freedom Party. Then we had in 1968, October 27th, the same day we were granted um, statehood, ships, statehood, associated statehood status. We had the launching of the Young Socialist Group. The funders were Casper London, Uragi, and Cassandra Brown, just to name a few. This grouping believed that the struggle was more classist than racist, than a race struggle. They, they um, produced two organs, one, a weekly one called Review, and a monthly one called Volcano. This group merged into two other groups to form what, what a lot of people would know of ULEMO, which we'll get later to in the presentation. Then we had OPCA. OPCA was formed in 1971 by Jim Maloney and Roger, um, Robert Patches Knights. Now these two individuals um, became very exposed to the 1970 revolution. They had a lot of um, training 
They had a lot of interaction with what was happening in Trinidad in 1970. This group, based on the interviews, um, it, was, it has been considered to be the most militant of the group. Um, they engaged in a lot of study grouping. The marijuana was also affiliated to, with um, OPCA. Persons whom I would have spoken to refer to it as the black power cigarette. It merged and it, formed, it and formed what was called the Ulimo. Then in 1973, we had a grouping called Black, funders being Renwick Rose and June Spirit Cutter. Then uh, also, what I, what I learned about the Black was that they had a 10-point agenda where they were focused on national independence, Pan-Africanism, land reforms, Caribbean integration, and a, and a call for a radical change in the education system, just to name a few. Um, what this group also offered was scholarships, and they, they, they um, supported students, how they can post students to go and get an education. Um, they had an underground publication known as Black, and they too merged to form what was called Ulimo. Then there was Awi. Awi was a, a, one of those groupings that is close to where I am from, so this Awi is... Um, that group in it, that is very close there to me. Um, so it was formed in the early 90s. A lot of people are still not sure at what point it was because it started as a community group. So it didn't have an official launch like the uh, we, like um, Black did or Ulimo did. It started as a community group where they had shops and they had farmlands and they were just offering evening classes and then eventually persons like Oscar Allen, who would have been a very close friend of um, Walter Rodney, Arlene Horn, and Solomon Butler and Simeon Grimm, they decided that they believed that education was the way out. So what they did was that they, they had um, classes, they offered classes to the poor and impoverished. Um, in 1981, January 19, um, they opened a building in the name of Rodney. Today they, call, they still call it the Rodney Center. Um, the activist wing of this movement, they, they eventually formed a, U, a, um, a political party called the United People's Movement. And while it, today we still have that, that um, community wing of that movement, and we call it the Diamondites. <laughs> then we have the New Rescuers Movement, in that this one is from the Leeward, another end of the island, and this share also pushed black power ide ideologies. This group, um, for me, it has, been a, it has been challenging in gathering information f about it because a lot of the persons aren't in St. Vincent and a number of them had, um, has passed. Carla Williams, he, what I know is that he, he, he was the funder. Now the Ulema, which a number of persons would have heard about, was the largest, well, it was the fusion of those small groups because I remember Renwick Rose told me that with all these small groups that were about St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the government at the time was not taking them seriously. So the best way out for them, they believe, was to fuse and then present a, 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 a much solid challenge to the government. And so they did in February, on February 2nd, 1974, um, YSG, Opka, and Black would have fused to form what was called Le Ulimo on August 4th, 1st, 1974. Um, they would have officially launched the organization. Now, this organization was the one that faced the most problems from the state. Um, there were two distinct narratives in the society at the time, like everywhere else. There was a black power, some, some believe that black power is not relevant to the society because we had Robert Milton Cato who was black, he was the prime minister. So they didn't think that St. Vincent needed any black power, any sort of black power movement. And there were those who were for black power who believed that it was certainly re relevant to St. Vincent because even though we had a, prime, uh, a chief minister who was leading the, the island, leading the island, um, they still lacked power. 
Now, the advocates' react, reaction to the movement was that they had an adoption. They adopted the Africa, African hairstyles. Also, they dress um, a lot of teachers, I was told, would have gone to school wearing their sandals and their dashikis. Um, also, there is an adoption of African names. So, in 19, not before, not, no later than 1974, I was told that we had an official naming ceremony where persons would have leg some legally adopted their name their African names. State repression took various forms. Um, there was an attempt to erode the, the freedom of the press. Also bans were imposed on people and literature and black poor rights were attacked. When I say bans were imposed uh, on people, meaning that there were persons in St. Vincent, so Ralph being one of them, Casper London being one of them, they were banned from entering certain spaces throughout the Caribbean. Also would have known of Geddes, Granga. Certain people also were banned from coming to St. Vincent. Um, also on my research, I would have found out that a gentleman called Casper and he was very militant, part of the, the YSG. He was pulled over at the airport because he had a, a book called The Industrial Revolution. So they took the books, they took, they took the letters, the letters um, he brought he brought home to give to other people and eventually he, he got them back. He didn't get back the Industrial Revolution book for sure, but he got the letters to give to the Black Power Rights were also attacked. Um, I was informed that homes were were um, broken into police came in and they would persons like um, Mike Brown. Persons like Mike, Michael Brown, Panel Campbell, their house would have been raided by the police and they would have taken away books, etc. Anything that, that, that spoke to black power. Now, the highlight of our movement was the murder of an attorney general called Cecile E. A. Rall on May 11, 1973, and also the teacher's strike in 1975. Now, the murder of the attorney general was one big fiasco. Um, the persons who, who were charged and then they were eventually released was one called Junior Spirit Cutter. Um, he is today alive and he is, I don't know how much persons know of him, he's fighting for the decriminalization of um, marijuana, but he's still up and about doing his thing. Along with him, there was a gentleman called Marcus Raycan James. He was 18 years old. And another gentleman called Lorraine Blackie Ledlow. He, the, all three were, were, no, one died, Raycon died. He was shot in the chase because they were, police were chasing these three guys for weeks and couldn't find them. So this, I'm saying time is up. So to wrap up, they were able to connect these three guys with, um, with the Black Paw because the vehicle that they used, they found a map of St. Vincent, a map of Africa, and a green flag with Africa and a notebook with, uh, with, the, uh, with the, the organization name called Black. So to, to end, um, the Black Power Movement was a triumph for blacks across the island. Um, some moved from working with whites for food, for only food, to working for a stipend. So to some extent, there was some form of econo economic power that was derived. In a broader context, however, the movement was successful for the revolutionaries in St. Vincent who believed that the oppressed peoples had a right to power. So the movement showed collectively the power and resilience which resided in the black race. Thank you. Thanks, Kirkland, Kirland. And now we have Adam Elliot Cooper from King's College London and the Monitoring Group UK. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to thank every, I just wanted to start by thanking the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to come and address you today, this afternoon. Um, this is my first time at the University of West Indies and my first time here in Jamaica. Um, I, as a, a, a very small kind of biographical note, I did my master's at SOAS same place as Walter Rodney um, in development studies um, and uh, to the shame of SOAS and the department, uh, Walter Rodney was not on any of our recommended readings and uh, neither was Kwame Nkrumah, neither was Franz Fanon, but that's another lecture for another day. Um, uh, so um, most of my research is based on black struggle in Britain. Um, I'm 
I'm of course British. Um, well, I'm only kind of British. I'm British when I'm here in places like the Caribbean. I'm not really British when I'm in Britain, because if I was, British people wouldn't always ask me where I'm from all the time. Um, to which, of course, I have to respond, St. Lucia. To which they respond, St. Lucia? And I say, it's in the Caribbean, it's near Jamaica. And they're like, oh, Jamaica, okay, okay. Um, so um, I want to do two, two things today. Um, they're slightly ambitious things, um, uh, but I'm going to give it my best. They're quite preliminary uh, thoughts and ideas I'm working on at the moment, so I'd appreciate your feedback, your critical feedback, um, on the development of those ideas. Uh, the first um, thing I want to do is try to draw out a, a genealogy, a link between anti-colonial struggle and labor movements in the Caribbean and anti-racism and black struggle in Britain. Um, the second thing I want to do is think about the legacies um, of these histories, um, drawing together rebellion, protest, strikes, and transnational solidarities um, in the hope that um, Rodney's revolutionary optimism can be um, brought forward today, um, as well as kind of looking back and learning from the past. And so I want to kind of conclude by reconnecting um, black struggle in Britain uh, to the global struggles for black emancipation. Um, Um, I might skip a few slides. So there is a kind of conventional story of, of, um, uh, of black migration to Britain. Um, and it starts with this, uh, the Empire Windrush. In Britain, we generally call it just the Windrush, um, but I think it's important to call it the Empire Windrush. Um, and this is, of course, as many of, I'm sure, many of you, I'm sure, are aware, is one of the first uh, boats which brought large numbers of Caribbean migrants to Britain um, in the 1940s and early 1950s uh, to come and work and rebuild Britain um, following the destruction of World War II. And generally, the... Um, the the, the mainstream kind of um, uh, narrative is that uh, these people were um, thought, you know, that the, the roads of Britain will be paved with gold and this will be the land of opportunity, the land of um, freedom, the land of um, enlightenment. Um, all of these fantastic things they'd learned about Britain when they were in school, when they were reading Dickens and Shakespeare and um, learning about the ecology of Britain and all of these other things and how Britain is one of the cradles of democracy and all of these uh, fantastic lies that the British education system teaches us. But of course, um, when they came to Britain, when uh, Caribbean people came to Britain and they worked in the hospitals and the transport systems and the factories and elsewhere, um, so the um, uh, mainstream narrative goes, they were shocked. And they were shocked because they came across racism. And they didn't expect this, apparently, um, when they came um, to Britain. And so what black people did was they began to develop anti-racist organizations. They began to develop black organizations, whether they be uh, black caucuses within trade unions or black caucuses within the British Labour Party, or whether they be uh, black supplementary schools for, to teach their children um, uh, uh, their own histories. Um, all of these different kind of organizations, according to a lot of the mainstream narratives, emerged as a response to this um, racism that they first experienced in Britain when they arrived in Britain in the 1940s and 50s. But I, I came across some, um, some literature in um, a radical black magazine called Race Today, uh, written by um, a publisher and a writer and activist called John LaRose, who many of you I'm sure are familiar with, that tries to complicate this history somewhat. So that's, that's John LaRose up there, um, and that's a copy of Race Today there, a journal, um, a, a magazine published in Britain in the 1960s and 70s. And what he, what he argues, of course, is that, um, and I, I think this kind of draws upon the, the, the previous um, uh, presentation to some extent, is that, of course, when Caribbean, came to, when Caribbean people came to Britain in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, this wasn't the first time they had experienced racism. They had, of course, experienced racism here in the Caribbean. But, but the difference is it was quite a different kind of racism. So the racism, of course, here in the Caribbean was a racial capitalism. It was, a, it was a racism in which white people owned the means of production. It was a, it was a racism in which white people owned the mechanisms of st state control. And so many of the political organizations that, of course, existed here in the Caribbean, the trade unions, uh, the black power organizations, all of these types of things, thought about anti-racism, thought about black struggle as being inher inherently linked with colonization and inherently linked with the capitalist mode of production. So when black people first came to Britain in the 1950s and 60s, 
many of the first black political organizations that were developed were actually British branches of Caribbean trade unions. So you had um, the People's Progressive Party, the, Nas the People's National Congress, um, a whole host of different uh, Caribbean trade unions um, and uh, political organizations having branches set up um, on the British mainland here in Brit um, over in Britain. And I think what's interesting and important about this is that what was actually um, different about Britain wasn't that there was racism in Britain. For many, for many of the black people that came to Britain, this wasn't a surprise at all, of course, um, because of the, the way in which racial capitalism functions um, here on the islands of the Caribbean. What was really a surprise was the racism from the British white working class. Because as John LaRose argues, um, he argues, John LaRose argues that um, these examples of racism from the black, black British working class wasn't, wasn't necessarily something that, they'd, that um, people who had come to Britain were accustomed to. They, their, their understanding of racism was something that was intrinsically linked with racial capitalism, with a, with a white bourgeoisie. A racism that was intrinsically linked with colonization, with a colonial elite. The idea that the white working classes, who particularly those, who were, those um, black people who were involved in radical nationalisms or national liberation struggles, or the Marxist, Marxist sections of Caribbean trade unions, were not really engaged in, were not really um, necessarily trained and had to retrain their thinking. And when, what John LaRose talks about is a particular moment um, in the late 1960s um, in, uh, I think it's the North London West Indian Association. And the North London West Indian Association's um, logo in the late 1960s was a white hand and a black hand clasping each other. And they had this big debate in the late 1960s about changing their logo. Because they said that when they came to when they've come to Britain, these white workers don't want to don't want to shake our hands. It doesn't really make any sense for us to have this logo. And in the end, they decided to sh um, change their logo to two black hands clasping and 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 having their logo around, around black solidarity. Because the white working classes in Britain were not ready for um, a multi a multiracial or multicultural working class solidarity. And of course, what, what, what began to happen was that in the 1960s, you have uh, the black power movements in the United States um, having huge influences across the world and really marking a lot of the kind of international solidarities that black people in Britain were involved in. And so what you begin to see is rather than simply Caribbean, British branches of Caribbean trade unions and the anti-colonial agitation that they're involved in being the main political organizations of black people in Britain, you begin to see solidarities with black peoples in North America and of course, um, um, uh, South, particularly the anti-apartheid movements in what was Rhodesia and, and is now South Africa um, as well. But you also, of course, begin to see people like Walter Rodney really being able to draw the links between those different transnational black struggles. So you see here um, Erica and Jessica Huntley, um, who ran a uh, radical uh, bookshop and publishing house in London, um, a part of London called Ealing in uh, West London, um, changing its name from Bogle Loverture um, Bookshop to the Walter Rodney Bookshop. Um, and the fact that um, Walter Ronnie was one of the people who was able to draw these links between the black power struggles in North America and in the Caribbean and in the African continent, and of course the anti-racist struggles happening in Britain itself, made him a really, really important person for thinking through these ideas, these questions of how do we address racism here on the British mainland that we're experiencing in our day-to-day -day existence, whilst also remain, making sure that we make our struggles transnational as well. But of course, as a new generation emerged in Britain who were not necessarily born in the Caribbean or in Africa, you begin to see more of a focus on the racisms in Britain. So you see here um, uh, British branches of uh, uh, the Black Panther movement. You see in the top right hand corner of this screen, this is, these are the urban rebellions in 1981 in Britain against uh, police racism. And you begin to start to lose those um, connections with uh, uh, Caribbean radicalism and Caribbean anti-colonialism and Caribbean labor organizations. And as time goes on, you get, great. As time goes on, things get even worse. 
Um, and with the onset of neoliberalization, the rise of Margaret Thatcher, you see the decimation of many of these radical black struggles that really came to prominence in the 1970s and 1980s. And, and black power, in, black struggle in Britain goes from being something which looks like this to something which looks a little bit more like this. Um, so it becomes institutionalized. It becomes about uh, diversity consultancy. It, it, comes, it, it has more to do with um, uh, diversity training than liberation from racial capitalism. And so what my kind of research has began to be, become interested in was the fact that there was a resurgence of black struggle in Britain um, in around 2011. Um, and in, in 2011, what you begin to see is a resurgence of black struggle following the killing um, uh, of a young black man called Mark Duggan. Um, and he's shot dead by, he's unarmed and he's shot dead by police. And what his killing leads to um, is a, uh, urban rebellions across England, the largest urban rebellions we'd seen in about 25 years. And so you, you, see, large, uh, you see large numbers of, you see um, police stations attacked, you see um, lots of commercial centres attached, shopping centres, um, out of shopping, um, kind of sh out of town shopping districts, lots of people taking to the streets, um, fighting both the police and many of the kind of emergent um, uh, large corporate um, commercial institutions, um, big shops, those kind of things being smashed up and looted um, as well. But you also see an emergence of black organizing as well. So these, these are some of the new black organizations that began to emerge following uh, the rebellions of 2011. Um, many, almost all of them centering not around um, uh, uh, labor, labor struggles and anti-colonialism as they were in the 1960s, but far more centered around policing and state power. And I think this is important because this is one of these, I think rather than uh, the workplace um, and, the, and, and, uh, ra and racial capitalism being the, the, being the center and the, being the, uh, the form of oppression which is in the immediate reality of the people that are organizing, it is the police that is, the, um, the, 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 that is in the immediate reality of the people that are organizing, the black people that are organizing for black, black emancipation um, in Britain. And so there are a number of different ways in which these kinds of movements emerge. Um, this is, um, so Mark Duggan, uh, the person I mentioned who was killed by the police, um, he had a, a white mother and a black father. Uh, this is his aunt uh, speaking at a protest here. Um, and what we begin to see are an, a, is a new way of kind of new and quite different forms of protest emerging in 2000. So what we begin to see is um, what we call shutdowns. Um, and what a shutdown is, is instead of having a strike as you had with the labor movements in the 1960s and, and, and 1950s and 1960s and early 1970s, you begin to see what we call a shutdown. And a shutdown is basically where a commercial center or a space of transit is shut down. So for instance, um, in 2015, in solidarity with um, people killed in the United States um, by the police, you see major commercial shopping districts in London just before Christmas, such as Bond Street and Oxford Street, shut down by people. So lots of black people get onto the streets and stop commerce from making money, stop capital from making money for a whole night on a busy shopping evening. You also see people shutting down spaces of transit, such as King's Cross Station, um, in solidarity with migrants. Um, and the big slogans there are, if they're not coming in, then you're not going out. And, we, and lots and lots of people blocked um, the, the entrances to the Eurostar um, uh, going to France. You also see, interestingly, lots of people shut down major shopping centres, shopping malls. Right? So on a busy Christmas shopping day evening where these shopping malls make huge amounts of money, you see hundreds and hundreds of black protesters entering these buildings, entering these spaces and shutting them down, stopping them from making any money for an, for an entire um, day and evening um, of shopping. And well, you also see a, a space of transit being shut down as well. So not only um, uh, uh, train stations, but also big motorways. So here you see uh, the motorways leading to Heathrow being shut down by Black Lives Matter activists, again protesting police brutality. And so I remember at, at the time that all of these kind of protests are happening, I was working at the monitoring group, which is run by um, older activists um, who were involved in the kind of more traditional kind of black struggles. And they were very confused by this. They were said to me, so, you know, when we, you know, when we want to protest something, we'd e when, you know, when we were your age, we would either go on strike with our trade union, or we would protest outside a police station or a government building um, if it was a case of police brutality. 
Why are the, these young people protesting at a shopping centre? Why are these young people protesting at a train station? Why are these young people lying down on a freeway? Now, you know, what has this got to do with the labour struggles? What has this got to do with police brutality? You know, there doesn't seem to be a connection here for us. And I began to think through these kinds of, you know, why is it that these, um, why, why is it that this is the emergent form of protest? Why is it that the new generation of black people are shutting down shopping malls? Why are black people now shutting down um, uh, uh, freeways? Why are they shutting down these train stations when they're protesting against racism? I think there's two or three um, uh, reasons, but I think one of the key reasons is, and I, I kind of, it kind of came to me when I was running a workshop with young black people about these kinds of histories of, um, of, of black struggle and trade unions. And I talked to them about these different trade unions in the Caribbean and the role that they had in uh, uh, anti-colonial agitation and how, and how the trade unions in Britain had been crushed by Thatcherism and crushed by neoliberalism. And um, at, the end of the talk, at the end of the workshop, I said, you know, has anyone got any questions about you know, these trade unions and the work they did? And one young man put his up his hand and he said, what's a trade union? What's a trade union, he asked. And I realized that you know, not only have, ha, has a younger generation of people not in, in, grown up in, a, in an environment in which it's the norm to be a member of a trade union, they've grown up in an environment where people don't even really know what trade unions are. And I think this is partly because people don't work in factories anymore. People, particularly black people in Britain, um, work in labor, which is what might call atomized. So they work in small coffee shops or small retail outlets rather than big factories where you know, people um, engage in labor struggle. Um, but I think it's also because um, uh, the ways in which um, trade unions have been defanged, right? the, way, the, re the ways in which uh, trade unions are nowhere near as powerful as they used to be in terms of their influence. And so what I began to realize is that, and I, I want, I, what I want to argue is that shutting down big shopping malls also disrupts capital flows. So if you're a member of a trade union and you want to um, uh, have some kind of political clout and you want to have political influence, you put down your tools and you disrupt capital at the point of production, right? Um, that's, what, that's the role of the trade union. And what I want to argue is that these big shutdowns, which shut down shopping malls, which shut down spaces of transit, also disrupt capital. But they disrupt capital at the point of transit and the point of consumption. And so I want to argue is that there are possibilities here for reconnecting and rebuilding and re-emerging these new forms of black struggle which rather than um, setting up Caribbean branches of trade unions and trying to re-engage these trade union struggles which disrupt capital at the point of production through strikes and other forms of labor solidarities, these young people are disrupting capital at the point of production, at the point of transit, and developing new ways in which they can de develop links of solidarity which connect capital to forms of, ra to forms of racialization and forms of racism. And I think in doing this, they can think about the ways in which the supply chain, which kind of ends, ends in Britain and Europe and North America, can be connected to other parts of the supply chain in the global south. Thinking transnationally about the ways in which we connect, can connect disruptions of capital to resistances against racism and global white supremacy in a way that I think hopefully reconnects black struggle to the global struggles for black emancipation. And I'll leave it there. Okay, so we've had two presentations um, from two younger um, intellectuals, two younger scholars, looking at different aspects and different places, different spaces, but also how to, how to reconnect from the present going back to the period that we, we've also been looking at 50 years or so ago. One of the things that it struck me was in the exhibition that we have, one of the things we're trying to do is look at the protest over the period of time, uh, not simply for 1968, though of course 1968, because it's 50 years ago, is, is, is part of our, our major focus. Do we have any questions or comments? Would you uh, go to the mic, in, identify yourself, and, uh, and give us your, your comment or question? Uh, yes, <clears throat> uh, just two questions briefly. One, 
Name Lloyd Gordon. I'm acknowledged here as a professor in molecular biology, genetics, retired but active, and uh, also a consultant. But originally I came from United Kingdom, so I'm a member of British Expertise. Um, my first question goes to the young lady from the... Um, Cave Hill. Cadia, yes. Uh, fascinating talk and very informative. Uh, I'm disturbed, though, that there is absolutely no mention about the maroon input because the leeward maroons were very instrumental in black power struggles a long time ago. And uh, the maroons contributed to the, um, uh, the uh, revolution in Haiti because they supported Toussaint Louverture. And um, Louverture uh, won uh, Bonaparte's military. So um, the Jamaican Maroons and their links with the Leeward Maroons and I think what is it, the Windward Maroons were a major part of the development of the black power struggle in the Caribbean and also it helped in the United States when it came to the um, revolution there. So I'm sad that there's absolutely no mention about the Maroons. That's just one side. Maybe you might care to look into that. The second one is having grown up in Britain as part of the Windrush uh, infancy, because I went there at the age of nine, by my parents who went there in Windrush, 1958, I think. I developed um, an awareness of the, um, the contestation. Uh, what I'm saddened by is in the presentation of this young man, because there have been shifts since that time. Um, there's absolutely no mention about the academic approach. We talk about the labor approach, because my father was very much involved in that. In fact, he ended up becoming a charge hand. And he told me they nearly killed him because black men were not supposed to become charges. And he was in line to become your foreman. So I knew intimately the black power struggle there through my father. On my side, uh, going to doing medicine at Norwood College, there was also a black power struggle because the British government was trying to exclude black students from England because they said they were too slow and they held up the white students from completing their lessons. At that time, I won an election against a very blonde, blue-eyed young man so I was seen right away as a leader in the Black Power movement. My information was published in the Evening Standard, if you check the archives. My approach was an academic one, and what I did was to send representation to the National Union of Students in Blackpool to represent the fact that the black people in England were not there to contest and to disrupt or anything like that, but to learn, and they want to go back to their country. So allow them to do that instead of increasing the fees. So that was how the British government was tackling it. But we tackled it academically in a more subtle fashion, and also through the British West Indies Students' Union, uh, of which there's absolutely no mention. So I think you need to get in you know, the academic thing. Uh, I was then president of the Norwood Union, but also I was president of the London Union, of, vice president of the London Union of Technical Colleges. And I related to the Jewish side, because Roger Lyons, his family owns a 40 group. They own the Pegasus here at one time. They were intimately involved in that struggle, so the Jews were actively involved in that as well. So you need to look at that aspect, and it's not just a classist thing. It's not just um, you know the labor movement. There's also a timeline which goes way back in history, and it has to do with the Jewish involvement, because the Rothschilds controlled everything. And the Rothschilds are the ones who formed the West India Coast Company, and they're the ones who uh, were mainly instrumental behind slavery in the Caribbean. So I think you need to do a little review there, you know, and try and incorporate that. All right. Thank you, sir. In response to your um, comment as it relates to Maroon, from my knowledge, we really don't have a Maroon community. Well, from what I know, Maybe there is, but I just have not found it yet. What we do have, we have a Garifuna community. Um, their involvement so far, as it really, because I would, I would have asked questions as it relates to their involvement in the movement for black power. Um, nobody seems, so far, no one has been shedding any light. I've been, asked, I've been questioning. Nobody has been shedding any light as it relates to the Garifuna's involvement in the movement. But Maroon, I may have to ask, but we end one of a Maroon community in St. Vincent. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, thanks very much for your question and your comments. Um, I, I think it's really important to think about the intellectual and the, the academic and the educational approach to um, black struggle. Um, it's something which I think has been written about quite a lot already, um, which I guess is why I wanted to make a slightly different intervention, which I think has been overlooked somewhat. Um, people like Gus John, uh, people like uh, Kahinde Andrews have written about both the black supplementary school movement um, in Britain, as well as things like the West African Students' Union as w and, and other parts of the kind of the black students' unions in Britain. Um, and it's something which is very close to my heart. I've, I've been involved in uh, black student struggles in Britain for um, a very, very long time. Um, but I think what I really wanted to do was to think about the fact that what's often been overlooked is that rather than black people coming to Britain and racism, racism, them learning about racism in Britain, I wanted to cement the fact that they ha black people had an analysis of racial capitalism and of racism being intrinsically linked with imperialism before coming to Britain. It wasn't an analysis that developed over time, which is kind of the mainstream um, uh, narrative. It's something which came to Britain from the Caribbean and in many ways is being lost. And I'm trying to recapture that history, which has been published in magazines like Race Today and in other kind of politi political pam pamphlets, but is missing from a lot of the kind of academic literature um, and historical literature, which um, is able to be, I think, a bit more kind of thorough. Thank you. We have another. Good afternoon. My name is Miata Desilme from the Haiti Jamaica Society. Thank you for your presentation. I'm sorry I missed the young ladies. Um, so I will address Mr. Elliot Cooper. Well, first, I preferred the Bogle Louverture name for the <laughs> bookshop, but that's on the side. Um, so we see where in the US, from the civil rights movement to Black Lives Matter, the system morphs to thwart the movement in a more subtle way every time, and the gains are lost, whether it's through gerrymandering, vote suppression, um, conservative judges in the Supreme Court, uh, normalizing the slaughter of young black men, the industrial prison complex that turns people back into slavery. So you were showing where um, this, in, in Britain, the movement became more sophisticated from people writing in the streets to the diversity training and you know the, that kind of marketing. So what I mean, do you how successful then is the, is the movement in Britain? Do you feel that blacks have made a head, significant headway? Um, you know where they are actually uh, uh, conquering the system or really being victorious in in that struggle? Um. I didn't want to give the impression that I thought um, uh, diversity training was more sophisticated than writing. I don't know if I think it is, if I'm, if I'm honest. I think that diversity training and um, equality and diversity initiatives and consult that kind of consultancy, I think is the, is the death of black struggle, to be honest. And I think it's an attempt to incorporate black, pe black faces into interracial capitalism. Um, I think that diversity training kind of happened in the colonies with, you know, Fanon talked about this, right? He talked about how uh, the, the, the black colonial bourgeoisie believe what they read in European textbooks until they become not the mirror image of the, uh, of the colonial bourgeoisie, but it's caricature. And I think that's exactly what diversity training is. It's not creating a black bourgeoisie, it's creating its caricature in Britain. Um, and I think that the movements that began to re-emerge in 2011 were kind of a reaction to this. They were like, we don't want diversity training. We don't want equality and diversity consultancy. We want liberation. We don't want capitalism anymore. Um, we, want, we want something different. We want socialism. We want communism. We want anarchism. Um, and so I think that, I think what's hopeful about what's happening in Britain isn't necessarily uh, the diversity training or the race equality, the uh, equality and diversity consultancy. Um, 
it's it's the, it's the emergent grassroots struggles against the, against policing. It's the emergent grassroots struggles against the prison system. It's the emergent grassroots struggles against uh, uh, the border system within Britain. I think those are the things that I think are most encouraging and exciting um, and sophisticated um, uh, happening in Britain. And I, and I hope that all of, I hope the diversity training and, and consultancy uh, goes away. If I'm honest. <laughs> Come to the mic. Come. Okay. Yes. You made a very important point. Um, Professor Campbell, could oh, you I please just made a presentation identify about. yourself for the mic, please? Oh, oh, my, name, my name is Horace. Horace Campbell. Thank you. Eh? I'm the presenter on Blacks in Britain. Yes. Um, you made a very important intervention on the nature of global capital and the value chain. I, I think what needs to be done is to deepen that in terms of how that fracture the concept of class and then to come back to the original development of British imperialism. I think that part of the presentation needs to be teased out a bit. Now, the other part of what you're talking about in relationship to the shutdown is something that's going on all over the Pan-African world, where one is no longer talking about just workers, per se, but the unemployed, traders, and other new forms of organization. I think to link the anti-imperialist content of that in other parts of the world with these shutdowns would strengthen the work that you're doing. Would you um, like to yeah, take that? Uh, very briefly, um, I didn't have, because there's so much I wanted to include in this lecture, but um, I yeah, didn't have enough time to. Um, some of this work has been done link, thinking about the global supply chains of imperialism and the fact that, obviously, the raw materials are extracted from the African continent. Uh, they're developed and processed in other parts of uh, the global south, and then they're consumed um, in the global north, generally, right? So, um, uh, as a kind of crude, uh, somewhat oversimplification. Um, and there are, there are some really interesting groups led by Congolese young people um, in Britain, um, where they shut down um, uh, um, Apple stores, they shut, shut down electronic stores in solidarity with their comrades back in, in, in Congo, extracting coltan and the other uh, raw materials necessary for the electronic components within those electronic products. And so what they're doing is they're tracing these global imperial supply chains. Right? shutting down multiple parts of the supply chain. Right? And so, so I think the next stage of this is to think, okay, so if there are going to be strikes, if there are going to be shutdowns on the African continent, which days are they happening? And let's do ours on the same day. I think that's the next stage that needs to happen. People are drawing those links already, are trying to shut down those parts of the supply chain, but it's about coordinating them, but both not just spatially, as we're doing already, but temporally right? um, through, at the same time. Good afternoon. That one. Yeah, come closer. My name is Helen Atkins. I'm at the Institute of Gender and Development Studies here. Um, just an aside to Adam, well done for sticking out in the UK. I've just given up and fled in disgust at the persistent, sorry, hypocrisy and uh, apathy uh, about these issues that we're talking about. Question to both speakers. Um, any thoughts or comments on the role of women in your studies? On the subjects. Who's sorry? The role of women. The role of women. Okay, sure. um, yes, you go first. Turn. In response to your question, yes, I do have been looking at the role of women. Um, what I have gathered so far is that we would have had some women out there, but the men, it was very patriarchal, more or less. So they were still in, on the back burner. But when I looked at her, I remember mentioning a name in Awi. Her name is Erlin Horn. She was one, she, today she's recognized as one of the most powerful women who, were, who was a part of the arm. Um, the black power movement but the truth is you will still hear about the Ralph Gonzalez and the Renwick Rose and etc etc but women I have, I'm, I have been discussing the role of women but they will not 
they're not very vocal about it as in the men who are doing the interviews. Um, thanks for the question, a really good one. Um, so I've, uh, it's another lecture for another day, but I've got a paper coming out in a journal called Antipode um, at the end of the year um, about the role of um, women in black struggle against policing in Britain. Um, uh, almost every campaign against a black death at the hands of the police in Britain is led by a woman, generally a female relative. Um, and what I've done is I've basically historicised this and I've thought about the ways in which black women are have historically been racialized by the British Empire and how that shapes their relationship with their struggles against the British state in the contemporary period. Um, it's called Our Life is a Struggle. Um, and it, yeah, it should be coming out at the end of the year. Um, but I can, if we talk afterwards, I can send you the, the version of it. Um, yeah, without taking up too much time yet, that's in a nutshell what, I, what I'm doing. Thank you. You want to go to the mic? In the meantime, I just want to, I just wonder about some of the transnational, we, we're talking about transnational confrontations, but in many ways, we're talking about kind of um, specific parts of, the, of that transnational space rather than those connections themselves. And I just kind of wonder about the possibilities for exploring those. For instance, you mentioned in terms of Walter Rodney um, and in terms of other activists, the bans put by the various governments of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was the case here in Jamaica. It was a case in Trinidad. There are many, many places where that has occurred. But we don't seem to see um, as a sort of grouped a, a, a situation where we're looking at the entire trans, trans regional space, if you like. And the same goes, in a sense, transnationally. Um, so, so where is the scope for those sorts of connections, for, for seeing those connections on a more global, global basis, whether it has to do with Walter Rodney or whether it has to do with the other activists of the 1960s or, or more broadly? Let's be, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, and then we'll come to this. Hi. No? <laughs> well, the truth is, um, I would have, the larger paper would have the discussions where what was happening in St. Vincent as it relates to the bands specifically, mm -hmm. Trinidad would have been experiencing the same thing, Grenada would have been ex experiencing, right. etc., etc. So if that is what you're looking for on, in the larger paper, yes, there is some form of I'm trying to connect what, what it's, I'm trying not to discuss St. Vincent in a vacuum, mm -hmm. but to, to include what is happening regionally and also internationally. Okay, yeah. excellent. Um, I think in the British context, there's a problem. Um, and part of the problem is that a lot of the younger generation of black people were of course born in Britain. And I think we've lost a lot of the transnationalism of, of our parents' generation who are not born in Britain. Or, or they were born in Britain, but or not on the British mainland, they're born in the British Empire. Um, and, and I think so some of that transnationalism has been lost, and I think it's been replaced with solidarities with, with black people in parts of Europe and black people in North America, which is important, um, but it means that we've lost those links with Africa, with Africa and the Caribbean to an extent. Um, but, well, to the, with, the, with the Caribbean. The, the good thing is, or the interesting thing, I should say, is, is that in 2011, in the 2011 census, for the first time, the majority black population in Britain went from being Caribbean heritage to being from the African continent directly. And those communities have far better links with back home. Um, uh, many of those um, African people, um, even if they're my age in their late 20s, early 30s, um, were not born in Britain um, and still have far stronger links um, with back home. And I think that we, that's being seen in the, in the ways in which they're building transnational links, such as the Congolese young people that, that I mentioned um, before. Um, the only other group of people that there's a lot of transnational solidarities with that I've noticed is with South Africa. Um, uh, as a student, I was in, we ran a campaign at, where, I was, where I was doing my PhD called Rose Must Fall Oxford, where we had really strong links with um, student struggles, black student struggles in South Africa um, and parts of Zimbabwe as well. Um, and we're seeing a lot of the kind of really radical uh, grassroots uh, social movements in South Africa having big influence um, in, in Britain as well. Thank you. We're going to take you and then Enrique. Yes, I don't have so much of a question, but you know, just something I wanted to throw out there. My name is Katie Ann, by the way. Um, I don't know what it is like very much in your country, your Caribbean island and other parts of the Caribbean, but it's just something that has always bothered me a bit, the way we like to say, we have a thing to say in Jamaica, most of, quite a number of us, that we don't have much of an issue of racism in Jamaica. What we have is classism. 
I totally disagree. What I really believe is that our racism is shrouded in classism, um, the economy, and the crime situation. So I would really want to throw that out there. If, if you notice, um, if you really go downtown very often, you will see that it's the people on the sidewalks who are getting you know, harassed by the policemen. It's the law, yes, but the law is set up convenient for a set of persons and inconvenient one other set. And it's always, of course, the black people. You know, we take it for granted. We just see them as people, but it's black people who are on the sidewalks and the Caucasians own everything from King Street, Street all of town. You know, nobody, or no black person owns anything on King Street in terms of the buildings and so on, as far as I know. I go there all the while. And, and I look also on the situation when it comes on to the, to the North Coast and so on. It's the black people who are protesting and talking about how the beach situation is affecting them. And it's the white people coming from, or the Caucasians coming from other countries, setting up hotels here, big hotels. The bigger the hotel, the more, the more likely it is going to be that it is a Caucasian person. And of course, their countries are benefiting. So I th we think we really take it for granted that we do have racism here in Jamaica. It is just very well constructed, you know? So I would love to first find ways in which, for the, you know, all of us, of course, we're all part of it. You know, I said, I don't know who it is. Of course, it's a common thread across the Caribbean, so I can imagine you have that issue too. So, you know, we can start to think about how we're gonna really go about the structure of it, breaking down the structure of that. You know, so that's just what I want to throw. Thank you. Not that I have anything that we can all have parts in it, you know. So I don't, I'm not saying that other races can have it too, but what about us? Thank you. All right. I'm just going to take both questions yeah. or comments. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Yes. Uh, Enrico Kenve, um, uh, historian of Africa, uh, lecturer here in the Department of History and Archaeology. Uh, it's, it's the end of the week. My hard drive is a, is a bit fragmented, so I'll try to make two quick points uh, as clearly as possible. Um, so the first one, I think, has to do with, uh, um, I think, both presenters, but also some of the presentations that we have had uh, since yesterday, and, and, and which I think we also see in Walter Rodney. It's the um, issue of um, multiple consciousness, right? Uh, and so we have highlighted the issue of like a sort of race consciousness, but also the issue of a class consciousness and, and so on. And, um, I'm, I, and, and, and if, if we think about, for example, uh, activist movements in this era, we see that this is even more complicated. Now we see like different consciousness coming, coming, into, coming together. So we have, yes, we have the uh, class or economic issues. We have the uh, racial issues, sometimes even the religious issues. And of course, we have gender, which has become very dominant in the last few uh, years. Um, so so in, this, in this way, I think, I think the, uh, the two of you, I think it will be interesting for, for the two of you to think about this a multiple consciousness because in a way it's also it almost seems, seems that to me as an activist at some point you have to take the decision as to what are the issues that are most relevant to us is this about the advancing uh, advancing the uh, the issues or, or, or the, the struggle of the black people or is it about uh, advancing the struggle of you know of like or, of the uh, half knots and, and and so on or and so on or is it about advancing the the, 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 the grievances of, of women and, and so on and you might that they, uh, they're, they're not mutually exclusive, but at the same time, I think that from a political perspective, it, it is in a way that you, you have to prioritize. And I think uh, in, in the presentations earlier, this, uh, this, uh, earlier today, we see how, for example, Rodney, uh, it seems to me, nobody said it, but it seems to me like uh, 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 issues of race become, in a way, less relevant towards the end and in and, and, and class and the class struggle becomes more relevant. It's almost like he, he, he has to make a decision uh, and so on. So I, I'm not sure if like in, in, your, in your papers you are, um, you, you're also trying to, to, to see how to reconcile this multiple consciousness and how these movements, uh, these different movements prioritize or not uh, what, what will be at the um, uh, 
uh, at the front of their uh, of their agendas. And the other issue, um, the other point I, I wanted to to make, I forgot about it, so I'll leave it here. Okay, so. Just remember. So yes, and I think this is more for uh, the first presenter. Uh, it has to do with the situation and, and issues that I saw um, uh, yesterday. I think responses in the Caribbean, responses in the Caribbean to 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 this quote unquote threat. And I think it's an interesting comparison that nobody has made is like uh, with the African situation, because what we see is how in the Caribbean we see the state responding to what they see, they perceive as threats to, to the integrity, to the security of the state, to the survival of the state, whatever it is. Um, but it seems to me when I listen to those responses is that the state is much more consolidated. Uh, and in terms of the responses of the state, there are more measured responses. If I compare to the responses in the African context, uh, what we see is like, uh, 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 African African states that were democratic states in in uh, like at the beginning of, uh, uh, of of independence with all the limitations and all the problems that they had. But what we see is that within a decade, democracy disappeared and the state, the nature of the state, totally transformed within within a decade. Not totally, I wouldn't say like the political nature in terms of like a participation and inclusion transformed within a decade. Something that we don't quite see in the Caribbean, and I think that is also important to to bring this sort of a comparison and, 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 and measure uh, these responses in relation to what they are young states, but at the same time also perhaps much more consolidated that we see in the African context, which as I said, like by the late 1960s, uh, uh, democratic regimes are virtually non-existent in the, in the African uh, context, yeah. Yes. I will comment firstly, young lady, um, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, like you said, the region, there is a tendency to, to um, complain that it is a classist struggle, that it's classist rather than racist, the racism. Um, the truth and the fact is that racial prejudice is still very strong in St. Vincent. It's just that it's very, it's clothed, it, it, it's cloaked nicely, you know, it's packaged nicely. And a lot of people do not pay much attention to it because we are mostly mixed up. So you have a lot of brown people walking around, so a lot of people are not. But the reality is, the darker your skin is, you still face prejudices. People would make some kind of remarks. That you know, in 2018, people still making that remark. But people would say, you know, we are about class. Everybody wants to be in the middle and upper class. You know, but it is the it is the Caribbean reality. Um, I would, in response to you, um, the with the original groupings, the Black Power groupings, and saying what I would have re recognized was that they started out being a racial. It was a racial struggle. However, over time, when people started to read, you know, more progressive works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, after the fusion, after Opka, YSG, and Black would have fused and formed Ulimo, they transformed into taking this struggle to be something much more classist. So the race, it was, it was important, but they started trying to, to, to um, break down the class, classist barriers that w was holding um, the, 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 the oppressed as being oppressed, so it, it eventually transformed, but initially it started out as a racist fight, and then it transformed into things. So on the question with regard to, um, uh, yeah, uh, classes, whether this is classism or racism, um, I mean, yeah, we have the same thing in Britain. Um, <laughs> uh, the idea that, yeah, this is all about classes, this isn't about race, um, and the fact that black people are poor is just some unfortunate coincidence of history, and we just need to focus on the class question. Um, the question of prioritizing race or class or gender, um, I, think, I, think, I think this is a problem for two reasons. I think the first is the fact that capitalism and gender norms and race developed concurrently with each other. 
Um, capitalism can't function without normative gender roles where women do the reproductive work in the home and the men sell their labor for, for wage labor. I, they, those things developed concurrently and I think that capitalism requires race in order to separate, not only to separate workers, but to separate the world, right? And so I think that if we, are, if we want to dismantle capitalism, we have to dismantle normative gender roles, and we have to dismantle race. If we want to dismantle race, we have to dismantle capitalism. We can't dismantle one and not the other um, because of the ways in which they developed um, in the first place. Um, and I think the other thing is that the normal functioning of the world is capitalist, the normal functioning of the world is patriarchal, the normal functioning of the world is racist. And so if we fail to prioritize all of these things, we will, in, we will our passivity will, re, will reproduce them, if that makes sense. So it's not enough to just not be racist, we have to be anti-racist. It's not enough to just not be patriarchal, we have to be anti-patriarchal. It's not enough to just be like, you know, just leave capitalism and leave class for now. We have to be actively anti-capitalist because if we don't, if we're not actively anti those things, we will passively reproduce them. Um, so I think for those two reasons, we cannot just prioritize one. We have to prioritize all of them. Thank you. We have one last question or comment. Uh, it's more by way of a Can you remember to yes, reintroduce Roberta, yourself? Roberta Kilkenny. My um, suggestion to Curlin, if you want to explore the transnational dimension a bit more, that you look more closely at Alfie Roberts. Um, Alfie, from what I understand, while in St. Vincent, was very much involved with carnival as a um, part, of, part of his activities. But then, as a young man goes to Montreal, where he spends the remainder of his life, he, the link to, to today is that he was one of the principal organizers of the Black Writers Conference in 1968. And when he died, he left his, his personal records and records of, of the conference um, in the trust of David Austin in, in Montreal. But he always maintained those connections with his homeland in St. Vincent and, and the Caribbean more generally. So I think um, if you look at, if you can you know, make that contact and look at his life a bit more closely, um, that that could have another perspective for your work. Thank you very much. You, you want to respond to that? Thank you for that. Um, Alfie Roberts, to be honest, is not a popular guy in St. Vincent and Grenadines. A lot of us do not know about him. Um, I would have learned about him maybe a couple months ago, to be honest. And his the, the history that what I have learned so far is is so rich. You know um, what he did for St. Vincent and Grenadines, and a lot of us do not know. It's very unfortunate. But of course, I take your um, your your comments and. I will, I plan to explore his life and what he did for St. Vincent as it relates to um, black, our black power movement because I also learned that he used to be one of those persons after they banned the literature from coming to our shores. Um, he was one of them who used to sneak them in however possible. I eventually learned that he, he was, he participated in that last year. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all um, in the audience. And thank you, of course, Curl and Bob and Adam Elliot Cooper. Please give them a, a round of applause.